Hey everyone, welcome to episode one of the Orange Peel podcast. I'm your host, Nikki, and I am so excited to have you here with me today. We are going to be, again, meeting me, we're going to be meeting our podcast, and we are going to dive right into those Bitcoin basics. We're going to look at the three pillars, in my opinion, of the foundations of Bitcoin. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I want to introduce myself really quickly. I am, again, Nikki, and I am a college student majoring in computer science. I'm also taking some econ classes on the side, so I will be examining Bitcoin through the lens of those two disciplines and maybe talking a little bit about the psychology of why it works or why it wouldn't work in between. But all these analytics are going to be in like three episodes time before we are able to discuss the why and the how, we need to make sure that we understand the what. Let me set the tone for this podcast before we get into the meat of the episode. This is not going to be a very polished lecture style podcast. And hopefully it's a little fun for you to listen to and follow along because I am definitely having so much fun when I'm prepping for and listening to these other videos to kind of consolidate my knowledge to put into these videos for you guys. So hopefully, you know, my delivery is is at least half as fun as what I'm having when I'm researching. Why Orange Peel? Why did I decide to start this podcast? So when I was starting out my Bitcoin journey, I saw a lot of content on YouTube, right? But the thing is, there's a lot of content, yes, but most of it is either super technical, getting into the nitty gritty math behind like the blockchain and the cap and everything, or it's pure price hype. I'm not going to be another crypto bro yelling at you to stack the sats or sell your house and buy Bitcoin. I'm not doing that. I'm not the place to go to for financial advice. I am here because none of the aforementioned stuff really works when you're starting from zero, especially if you're a college student and you don't have any time. You need someone to consolidate all of the foundational knowledge, consolidate their learning journey, and put it into like 20 minute episodes that you can listen to like on the Stairmaster, in your commute to class, or like when you're washing the dishes. I don't know, whenever you have some spare time, you would need a consolidation of knowledge that has everything you need to know without the wall of crypto bro jargon. That's why Orange Peel is here. My goal is to make this podcast the one that I wish I had when I had first heard about Bitcoin. I want it to be honest aha moments, plus all of the stuff that still confuses me. So if you've ever been scared to like ask a dumb question about Bitcoin, number one, me too. Number two, that's why I'm here. I'm here so you can ask me the questions and I can go out to the rest of the internet, learn the answer and come back and convey it to you. So speaking of starting from zero, Let me tell you a little bit about when I first heard of Bitcoin, because this takes me all the way back to like 2022 when I was writing my IB extended essay. And if you didn't do IB, I congratulate you on making the best decision of your life. But also, um, just to explain, the extended essay is a massive research paper that you write in between your first and second years. I chose to write mine on the 2008 global financial crisis. So when I was doing my research and prepping for this essay, I discovered a lot about risky lending, bank failures, like Lehman Brothers, um, and like government bailouts and all the mortgages and everything, and how... All of this sent economic shock waves throughout the world. But buried in that research, there was this little thing called Bitcoin. Back then, I thought Bitcoin was like, I kid you not, something like internet money. It didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand why you would want a currency that you can't even touch, that you can't even hold, that no one's in charge of, right? It, It doesn't make any sense. Our current system, we know who's in charge of it. You can hold a US dollar. You can make more if you need it. You can't do any of that with Bitcoin. So at the time, I kind of just 
disregarded all of that. But the more that I read, the more that I realized Bitcoin's release, the Bitcoin white paper came out in January 20, no, sorry, January 2009. And the Bitcoin white paper was this book, not book, documents written by Satoshi Nakamoto, which is the alias for the Bitcoin founder, because we really don't know who it is. It's this coalition of what Bitcoin is, how it works, blah, blah, blah. So it comes out in 2009. And as I'm researching for my extended essay about the GFE, GFC, right, I'm realizing this comes out, Bitcoin came out to serve as an alternative to our current system where banks and governments can change the rules of money whenever they want. And we're the ones that have to suffer the consequences of that. So that connection really, really stuck with me, right? Now, again, like years later, I'm coming back to Bitcoin. We've had the 2017 boom. We had, you know, Bitcoin like hit 100K in December last year. And then we had the U.S. government create a reserve, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're kind of watching it hit 120K yet. I don't think it has, but we're watching it because it's very close. With that being said, I want to bring you to the starting point of the whole journey. We need to understand the foundations of Bitcoin because before you can have an opinion on it, before you can decide if you back it or you don't, you need to know what it's built on. The way that I see it, there are three pillars to the foundations of Bitcoin. We've got pillar number one, the blockchain. We've got mining. And then the last one is a 21 million cap. We're gonna start with one, blockchain. Now this word was the one that scared me the most when I was first learning Bitcoin because blockchain, right? Like that's terrifying. I'm sure you would probably picture like a few supercomputers doing crazy energy consuming math calculations. That's kind of what it is, but also not really. I'll put it in an analogy, I think, to make it make the most sense. So. Let's imagine that there's a public diary that's copied to thousands of computers all over the world. Every time that someone sends Bitcoin, so if I was sending Bitcoin to someone named Bob, that transaction, Nikki sends one Bitcoin to Bob, would be listed on this public diary. Everyone has access to read every transaction in this diary but no one person can ever rip out pages or rewrite history. You can basically assume that this will never happen because in order to make a change to the diary, you have to get the approval of all of the other computers. And I'll put this an example of a Google Doc because it's important to understand that it's not just one person who is guarding this diary, right? It is everyone all at once. It's like a Google Doc. And you know how Google Doc has that suggesting feature where, you know, you're working with someone and you can go and suggest an edit and then the other person has to go in and approve it if it's going to make a finalized change to the actual document. It's like that. So if I were to make any changes, I would need the approval of all of those thousands of computers. That's the blockchain. It's the unchangeable record of every Bitcoin transaction, basically ever. So who's actually in charge of updating that diary? That's where mining, pillar number two, comes in. It's nothing like anyone first imagined, honestly. When I first heard of mining, I literally thought this was like, the computers need to dig into this digital Bitcoin vault and they need to like, go through hurdles to extract Bitcoin to put it out into circulation. That's kind of what it is, but there's no digital Bitcoin vault. What simply happens is this. Imagine a giant Sudoku race where you have millions of computers that are solving these crazy hard math puzzles. The first one to get it right adds the next page to that diary. 
they add the next block to the blockchain. And every person, every miner that gets to add that next block earns new Bitcoin as a reward. That's how the system stays secure without a bank, without a government or any central third party. It's mining. It's validation from millions of computers. Now, there's a huge energy debate around mining, but we'll get into that later in probably an Ethics of Bitcoin episode further down the line. Pillar number three is where it really gets interesting. It's the 21 million cap, right? Even if you're not into math, even if you're not into tech, you're going to want to tune in, tune in for this part because this is my favorite part of Bitcoin like all together. It has this rule baked into its code, literally embedded into its central system. And this completely changes the, t the money game. Bitcoin's code says there will only ever be 21 million coins ever. No one can change that. Not like the government, not a billionaire, not Elon Musk, not even Satoshi Nakamoto, assuming they're still alive, assuming they come out of hiding or anything. No one can change this code. What's done is done. I guess like a vending machine. Think of a vending machine. We know that we can take things out of the vending machine. Um, but we can't go and refresh its supply. We can't add anything. So if you compare that to like USD, AUD, the GVP, the Euro, INR, whatever, whatever your preferred currency is, whatever your preferred fiat is, it's, it's a huge difference. The US government can say that they want to print more USD at any given time. And from an economic perspective, this is where Bitcoin wins because a fixed supply of 21 million creates scarcity. And scarcity is one of the biggest reasons people see Bitcoin as hard money. Now, hard money is essentially just money that has a fixed supply, money that is not affected by inflation. But this is how I understand hard money. This completely solves the problem of inflation, doesn't it? If I have a fixed supply of 21 million and I can never change that, that means the value of one Bitcoin can never change. One Bitcoin in 2009 is equivalent to one Bitcoin today, which is equivalent to one Bitcoin in 2054. The same cannot be said for fiat money, like a USD. One dollar in 2009 is definitely not equivalent to one dollar today which is definitely not equivalent to one dollar in 2059. if the problem of inflation goes away why haven't we adopted bitcoin altogether as a currency it's one of the questions that i wish to find an answer to so this is where all of the different lenses that i want to examine bitcoin with kind of come together in coalition from a tech side, it's absolutely wild that code is able to enforce rules better than any central bank or government. And from an econ side, a fixed supply, again, it totally changes the game. It totally changes how we think about money, about saving and inflation. But from a psychology standpoint, why should people trust code and computers and math over actual humans? Because I know that all of us would prefer to have a human dealing with our money that we can actually see and we can actually touch so we feel more connected to, as opposed to having this digital entity called a Bitcoin that we've never seen, that we don't really know exists because it's just code, it's just numbers. Why should people trust this? All of that is the stuff that I want to dig into. But again, before I can get too far ahead of myself, we need to make sure that we understand the foundations. So what the heck is Bitcoin in one sentence? It's like a digital gold that you can send anywhere without banks and math and computers, or not really computers, but math is the thing that keeps it honest. And I can get into the math behind the blockchain, behind mining, and behind why there's a 21 million cap if you wanted to, but in short, 
we have there were a certain amount of bitcoin that were kind of in circulation or left as the reward and then there was a certain amount that went to circulation and then the reward geometrically decreases over time um but i can get into that math next episode if that's something that we want to see all right that is it for today's episode so let's wrap this up super quickly and let's bring it home we went into the blockchain, we went into mining, and we went into the 21 million cap, which again, I see as the three pillars of the Bitcoin foundations. There's definitely more, but I think this is all you need to understand why this is able to work completely decentralized without any interference from a third party. So that's episode one, and questions that I still have include everything I discussed earlier from each of the lenses, as well as like, is it bad for the environment? Why is it such a bubble online that's associated with crypto bros and middle-aged corporate people? And how does Bitcoin storage really work? Let's say I went to go buy one. Where would I even go to go buy one? When I go buy one, where does it go? Do I get like a little card that's like one Bitcoin? I don't know. So Next time, next week, I will be digging into wallets, public-private keys, and how you would actually use Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis. I think right now that might change. Um, yeah, that's it for today. So if you're learning too, hit subscribe, comment, let me know your biggest Bitcoin question. Let me know what you liked and didn't like about this video. Maybe I'll go and I'll put it into a future episode. Thanks for hanging out today. Again, I'm Nikki, and I will see you next time. Bye!